we talk about a broad class of linguistic expressions that are sometimes called adverbs or adverbials. Now, an adverb is a specific syntactic category, like other syntactic categories, subject, object, verb, and so on. Uh, it usually specifies something more about a verbal referent. Okay. But the term has also been used as a wastebasket category. So every time you don't know what exactly um, a word or uh, a certain linguistic expression does, people have a tendency to call it an adverb or an adverbial. An adverbial is the collective term for phrasal modifiers of verbs and clauses, including phrases headed by adverbs. Okay, so there are all kinds of things. Adverbials could be prepositional phrases and lots of other things. Uh, they prototypically specify time, place, or manner. Okay, so suppose I say, Hema slept the entire afternoon. The entire afternoon is an adverbial. Madhu took the bribe in his house is an adverbial. Hemanga sings beautifully. Beautifully is an adverb, but it's, but it's also part of an adverbial. The adverbials pass your usual constituency tests. So for example, a temporal adverbial with a durative WH word like for how long, the locative adverbial with a WH word like where, the manner adverbial with a WH word like how. So suppose I ask, uh, how long did Hema, Hema sleep? You can answer that by saying Hema slept the entire afternoon. So that tells you that the entire afternoon is a constituent. So there are things like this uh, that um, show that they are basically, that they're, they're well-behaved constituents. An adverbial phrase can be syntactically many things. They could be adverb phrases, they could be a noun phrase or a determiner phrase, they could be prepositional phrases, and so on. Adverbials are typically optional, but there are corresponding syntactically to adjuncts. But in some cases, they could also be arguments. So for example, suppose I said, Hema treated Vijay well or Vijay behaved badly, or the place lies in shambles, well, badly, and sham in shambles in these examples are arguments because you can check that Hema treated Vijay doesn't quite mean the same thing. It doesn't quite have the same meaning that treat someone well does. Okay, similarly, behaved badly, the badly has all kinds of argument-like properties. Similarly, lies in shambles. In shambles has many argument-like properties. It's partly because lie in shambles is quasi-idiomatic. And um, so in shambles is syntactically a prepositional phrase, but it's also an ad it looks like an adverbial, but it acts as an argument. Um, adverbs commonly occur in adverbials, but they can also play non-adverbial roles. As in the following example, yesterday was very boring for Hema. The entire afternoon was spent sleeping, and so on. Adverbs are typically categorized according to their lexical semantics. So you have temporal adverbs like tomorrow, then, now, forever, afterwards, and so on. There could be locative adverbs like outside, here, everywhere, inside, and so on. They could be temporal adverbs, all the time, often, sometime, occasionally, and so on. Now, adverbials can be semantically classified into three main types. You have the predicational adverbials, you have the participant-oriented adverbials, and then you can have functional adverbials. This is a classification of adverbials that comes from Tom Ernst that you can find uh, in Tom Ernst's 2002 book. Predicational adverbials assign a property to the referent they combine with. Participant-oriented adverbials introduce an entity that modifies 
the eventuality described by the verb, and functional adverbials. That's the catchphrase that mops up all other kinds of adverbials, like quantificational and discourse-related adverbials. Okay? The functional adverbials is a kind of heterogeneous class. The, others, the other ones uh, can be better defined um, what they are. So let's look first at predicational adverbials. What are predicational adverbials? These can be further subdivided semantically into sentence adverbials and verb-related adverbials. They are also sometimes called higher and lower adverbials. Now examples of sentence adverbials Sent sentence adverbials are syntactically are hierarchically higher in the attachment and modify the overall proposition expressed by the sentence. Verb related adverbials are syntactically attached hierarchically lower and they typically modify the verbal referent. Sentence adverbials can be further subdivided into subject oriented, speaker oriented and domain adverbials. Subject-oriented adverbs, Jack and Duff, 1972, give a certain property to the agent based on the action described by the sentence. So consider the following sentence, Vijay arrogantly, idiotically sent a letter full of lies to his higher-up. Now in this sentence, the speaker judges Vijay to be arrogant, idiotic based on the action described in the rest of the sentence. Right? So this is an example, remember this is an example of this does not modify the verb, it still is an attitude expressed uh, by the speaker, an attitude that the speaker attributes to Vijay based on um, what Vijay did. So basically you know you, you can translate the sentence that I just mentioned um, you can paraphrase it by saying it was arrogant or idiotic of Vijay to have sent a letter full of lies to the higher up. They are also veridical. This means that if you take out the adverb, see the rest of the sentence, the sentence with the adverb entails the sentence without the adverb. If I say Vijay arrogantly or idiotically sent a letter full of lies to his higher up, it entails that Vijay sent a letter full of lies to his higher up. Speaker oriented adverbs provide an opinion of the speaker on the proposition expressed. They can be further subdivided into speech act adverbials, epistemic adverbials, and evaluative adverbials. Speech act and evaluative adverbials describe the speaker's attitude towards the content of the sentence. Honestly, frankly, Vijay was foolish to send a letter full of lies to his higher up. Unfortunately, surprisingly, Vijay was foolish to send a letter full of lies to his higher up. Epistemic adverbials, on the other hand, express the speaker's expectation with respect to the sentence. Okay, and you can think of them as being epistemic models expressed syntactically by means of adverbial expressions. So suppose I said, Probably, surely, Vijay was foolish to send a letter full of lies to his higher up. Domain adverbials is the other kind of adverbials. They restrict the domain in which the proposition is evaluated. So suppose I say, emotionally, morally, ethically, Vijay lacks sincerity. Okay? There is something about, you're expressing an attitude about a relationship of Vijay with sincerity, but you are restricting it to particular domains. Um, and that is an example again of a proposition related adverbial, a sentence adverbial. Now verb related adverbials are a different kind altogether. They are closely linked to the verbal action. They can be subdivided into all kinds of things mental attitude adverbials, they could be manner adverbials, they could be degree adverbials, 
Mental attitude adverbials describe the attitude of an agent towards the action referred to by the verb. Okay? So suppose I say, Vijay intentionally or gleefully sent a letter full of lies to his higher up. Manner adverbial specify the manner in which an action happens. Vijay quickly or skillfully wrote a letter full of lies to his higher up. Manner adverbials cannot take scope over sentential negation, typically. Vijay did not write a letter full of lies to his higher up skillfully. It's not the same thing as saying Vijay did not write a letter full of lies to his higher up and he did it skillfully. Okay? So skillfully, when it occurs in a sentence like that, has to have scope under negation. It cannot mean that it was that uh, Vijay did not write a letter full of lies, I was skillful. Okay. It only means that what Vijay did was not skillful. Uh, degree adverbials indicate the gradation or intensity of the action. So suppose I say Vijay loves himself deeply or completely, the degree adverbials typically are accompanied, they can go with stative verbs, they can also go with uh, active verbs, okay, but manner adverbials, for example, typically go with um, active verbs rather than stative verbs and so on. The other kinds of adverbials are what are called participant-oriented adverbials. A participant-oriented adverb or circumstantial introduces a new participant in the eventuality described by the verb. So suppose I say Vijay wrote a letter full of lies with his own pen in his room, okay, with his own pen and in his room introduce in the discourse some new participants, uh, new participants in the action that's described by the verb, so pen and so, uh, if you didn't have the adverbials, you would simply say, Vijay wrote a letter full of lies, okay, but as soon as you say, with his own pen, you are saying, uh, you are introducing the instrument of the action. As soon as you say, in his room, you are introducing the location of the action. Now, in Neo-Davidsonian semantics, you know, this follows the work of Donald Davidson from a while back. They are linked to the event by thematic roles like location and instrument, the, the particular kind of things I mentioned. The last class, functional adverbials, are a mixed set of adverbial quantifiers and discourse anaphoric individuals. So suppose I say Vijay often, usually, every year, wrote a letter full of lies to his higher ups. Vijay thus, therefore, wrote a letter full of lies to his higher-ups. Adverbials have to be distinguished from depictives and resultatives which do not modify the verbal event, but one of the participants of the event. So take a look at the examples like, Vijay wrote a letter full of lies to his higher-up drunk or angry. Vijay plucked the chicken nude. Okay, now in these cases, it, these are adverbial expressions, but they do not modify the verbal event, but rather what they do in the first example, uh, you are basically saying that Vijay was drunk, Vijay wrote a letter full of lies to his higher ups, and he did that when he was drunk or when he was angry. Similarly, when you say Vijay plucked the chicken nude, that means Vijay was nude when he plucked the chicken. Sometimes manner adverbials and resultatives cannot be completely separated from each other, resulting in what are called blends. So suppose I said, Vijay writes an untruthful letters marvelously. It's a resultative in the sense that uh, you're, you're describing that the result of the action is marvelous, okay? But it also tells you something about the manner of the action. Uh, so here the result of uh, the writing must also be marvelous for the action, but also 
it's an attitude that you also attribute uh, to Vijay, who's the subject um, of the action. A theoretical approach is two adverbials. Now, there are various uh, syntactic and semantic accounts uh, of adverbials. So there's a variety of syntacticians who have worked on um, the syntax and semantics of adverbials. And the semantic interpretation of adverbial is tied to the syntactic position to some extent. So for example, Jack and Duff, 1972, long time ago, noticed that uh, he basically he distinguished three basic positions for adverbials in English. The initial position, the final position, and auxiliary position that was between the subject and the verb. Some adverbs are good in all the three positions, some are not good in the final position, some are not good in the initial position. So you can say frequently, vijay, frequently writes untruthful letters frequently. So frequently can appear before in the auxiliary positions at the end. Evidently can appear in at the beginning of the sentence between the subject and the auxiliary but not at the end. Easily on the other hand, normally cannot apply at the beginning of the sentence. Okay. And what Jack and Duff showed that the different distributional patterns have a semantic basis. The speaker or subject-oriented verbs do not allow final placement, and manner adverbs uh, do not allow initial placement, at least in English. Okay? It's slightly different in languages where, where uh, the word order is freer, presumably it will be somewhat different, but this is the case in the more rigid word order languages like English. Now, there are some entirely syntax driven approaches to the positions of the adverb. So one example of that is Cinque, who assumes a fixed universal hierarchy of adverbials. Adverbials are merged as specifiers, each in its uh, special position. But there are also a variety of semantic approaches. A semantic approach to the position of adverbs can be found in the work of Tom Ernst, Ernst 2002, Heider 2000, who argue that there is an interface condition mapping syntactic C command domains onto semantic domains, and that is responsible for the adverbial placement restrictions. Syntax itself does not specify where to merge an adverbial or prohibit an adverbial from merging someplace. Haider, 2000, distinguishes three domains, proposition, event, process state. Proposition comes high, event comes below that, process state further down. Ernst assumes a slightly richer set. So for Ernst, you have speech act, then comes fact, then comes proposition, then comes event, and then comes something he calls specified event which roughly corresponds to process or state um, in Heider's work. So consider a pair of sentences like the following. Vijay probably or cleverly wrote a letter full of lies to his higher-ups. That's a good sentence. Vijay cleverly probably wrote a letter full of lies to his higher-ups. Now, on the syntactic approach, the second sentence does not reflect the fixed universal order, okay? Probably cleverly is good, but cleverly probably is bad. Okay, so you say, Vijay probably cleverly wrote a letter full of lies to his higher ups, that's good, but Vijay cleverly probably wrote a letter full of lies to his higher ups is not a very good sentence in English. Now, in the syntactic approach, the second sentence does not reflect the fixed universal order of the adverbial merge position, but the first sentence does. On the semantic approach, the adverbial cleverly selects for events, and the adverbial probably selects for propositions, and when probably is merged into the sentence, it becomes of the type proposition and cannot therefore then be merged with cleverly, which selects for events, okay? So that's, uh, this is the kind of thing 
that a semantics heavy approach to the distribution of adverbs would take. Now there are also other approaches to the distribution and interpretation depending on the distribution that take a more mixed approach that includes elements of what's taken to be idiosyncratically syntactic, uh, but also semantic considerations into accounting for the distribution uh, of adverbials. So one such proposal comes from Frey, uh, uh, Frey 2003. Uh, according to Frey 2003, adverbials are freely base generated within the limits of their region and can also move as long as they don't cross their characteristic region. Okay, so sentence adverbials come before frame and domain adverbials, which come before event external adverbials like causals, which come before the highest ranked argument, which comes before event internal adverbials like locatives, etc., which comes before internal arguments, which comes before process related adverbials, and so on. Adverbials with comma intonation, the so-called parenthetical adverbials, however, are outside the syntactic structure and can appear in many positions in a sentence. So take a look. Obviously, Vijay obviously writes untruthful letters, obviously. So the comma intonation obviously is acceptable in each of these positions that I just mentioned. Now, let's come back brief and talk briefly about the interpretation, uh, the semantic interpretation of the adverbials. There are essentially three kinds of formal semantic analyses that account for adverbials. One is the operator approach of Thomason and Stalnecker, 1973. Then there is the argument approach of McConnell Ginet from 1982. And the predicate approach of event semantics, which comes from Davidson 1967, but its application to adverbials can be found in more detail in a 1985, uh, in a 1989 paper by Jim Higginbotham called Elucidations of Meaning. Now, what's the operator approach? In the operator approach, adverbials are functors that apply to arguments of a certain type without changing the type. So they are endotypical functors. In this approach, sentence modifiers are simply analyzed as functions from sentence in intentions to sentence intentionals. So an adverbial like necessarily is of type STST and it composes in the following way. Suppose I say necessarily, Vijay is a liar. Vijay is a liar expresses a presupposition necessarily acts on a presupposition, it gives you another presupposition. Uh, the opaqueness of uh, adverbs is straightforwardly accounted for because sentence modifiers apply to sentence intentions rather than their extensions. So you would, you would expect them to be referentially opaque. Predicate modifiers are taken to map intentions of one place predicates into one place predicates. In the case of transitive verbs, so suppose I said Vijay intentionally wrote lies, uh, intentionally takes the, the intention of the verb phrase and gives you another verb phrase intention that basically tells you something about um, uh, how uh, the lies were written. Now the operator approach also nicely accounts for the scope effects. So suppose you said Vijay painstakingly wrote untruthfully, they are writing untruthfully is Vijay is taking pains to do. So painstakingly has scope over untruthfully. The operator approach accounts for this correctly because syntactically the higher adverbial is applied last. The operator approach also has various problems and many of these problems were in fact pointed out by Sally McConnell Ginet in her paper and where she develops something called, uh, that you might think of as being an argument account. So you say things like, Vijay dresses garishly, okay? That's a good sentence, but Vijay dresses isn't quite good. Uh, what McConnell Ginet does is uh, to generalize this to all adverbials and proposes 
that verbs have a latent potential of being further specified with other properties. What adverbials are supposed to do is activate this potential and fill the corresponding property. For example, write has a latent argument slot for speed which is activated and filled by an adverbial like quickly. So that's what you get when you say uh, Vijay wrote the letter quickly, so whenever quickly appears. Okay. So <coughs> to derive this interpretation, um, Nathaniel Ginet proposes an operation of verb augmentation by which uh, you introduce uh, something, uh, additional argument slots become available whenever they are needed and that's the way you interpret um, adverbials. And she also has an account which there are various things you distinguish between um, different kinds of adverbials uh, in various different ways. The third approach is the predicate approach and this is the event semantics approach which many linguists nowadays uh, adopt. And this is essentially to assume that whenever you say something like Vijay wrote the false letter, uh, what you're saying is you're describing and you're asserting the existence of an event uh, of which Vijay is the agent, the false letter is the theme, and the right itself is taken to be uh, a predicate of events. On this kind of an approach, whenever you have an adverbial, at least low, the, 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 the verbal modifying adverbials, um, all they do is you're introducing further arguments that modify the event variable by means of conjunctions um, and uh, this actually gives um, uh, a nice account of the way, for example, manner adverbials, etc. are interpreted. Okay? Now you still on this approach you have to say something about uh, sentential adverbials, the, the, the subject oriented and so on. Uh, and most people who work on adverbials essentially account for those kind of adverbials in various uh, different ways.